All right, our, our lecture for today it begins on page 238 of the lecture notes, and we've spent the last two times talking about some of the elements of 19th century Christianity, even the week before that. We were talking about the Second Great Awakening, and in thinking through the Second Great Awakening, we were talking about this revival in which it was a real revival. There was the preaching of the gospel that was going forth in Presbyterian circles, Baptist circles, Methodist circles, and yet at the same time, uh, there were some really negative byproducts that also came out of the Second Great Awakening, including an emphasis on emotionalism and really an emphasis on ways in which you could coerce, orchestrate, or manipulate people into creating a, a false revival. And that we called revivalism, and we looked a little bit at Ian Murray's book, Revival and Revivalism. It's not surprising then to recognize that out of the spiritual fervor that was created during the Second Great Awakening, that there are going to be some results, some fruit that are very positive and good, and some fruits that are negative and bad. And uh, we've talked a little bit about that. Now, in our discussion of 20, uh, excuse me, of 19th century theology, the 1800s, we kind of had three broad categories, and so we talked about the, the good, the modern missions movement, some of the good parachurch organizations that were started really as a result of the Second Great Awakening. We looked at that on Thursday of last week. We talked on Tuesday of last week about the bad and saw that in the rise of liberalism and higher criticism, especially in Germany, and today we'll talk about how some of those ideas affected and infected the American church as they made their way across the Atlantic. But really, a nat a, an enlightenment, rationalistic, naturalistic, a priori commitment in their worldview uh, led the liberals to deny the supernatural inspiration of the Bible. As a result, they did not see it as the word of God. They did not see it as true even though they said it had some good moral principles in it. And so liberalism really is this attempt to maintain the label Christian while denying the Bible as true, and so finding some other foundation on which to base your Christianity. For Schleiermacher, it was religious experience. And then for Albrecht Ritchell and the social gospel architects, it was moral action in society. And the idea became that redemption is no longer about the individual sinner from hell and from sin. It is rather redemption is about society and culture. So we're going to redeem the culture, whatever that means. And usually the way it worked itself out was just to try and make the society around you a better place through your own moral influence. We'll talk a little bit more about that today in terms of its effects on American Christianity. Then we have the ugly category, and uh, I think this is actually a very appropriate category for some of the groups that we're going to talk about today, which would be the modern American cults. And they also are an offshoot of the Second Great Awakening, not an offshoot of clear biblical teaching, obviously, <laughs> but an offshoot of some of the religious fervor and zeal that began to characterize American society during the early 1800s. And so these modern cult groups arise in the 19th century. In the case of the Jehovah's Witnesses, technically in the early 20th century. And so we'll talk a little bit about these groups. And so this lecture I've called uh, Cults, Cultural Christians, and Charismatics. And we'll look a little bit at each of these groups, but first the cults in particular. In the late 1700s, especially in the early 1800s, uh, two individuals, uh, Stone and Campbell, uh, Alexander Campbell and uh, Barton Stone, these two individuals, uh, gave birth and rise to a movement that was known as the Restorationist Movement. The Restorationist Movement was an attempt to get back to the primitive early church. Sometimes this is called primitivism, uh, 
It's the idea that the creeds and councils and confessions of church history are all corrupt and we need to get back to the first century church. So we kind of need to skip over church history and go all the way back to the beginning and hit the restart button. Uh, Stone and Campbell uh, created a new movement uh, that was uh, initially it was an attempt to unify all of the Christian denominations under one roof. And so they called their church the Church of Christ or the Christian Church, also known sometimes as the Disciples of Christ. And really what they created was more or less a uh, cult slash denomination. There are certainly cultic uh, tendencies within the Church of Christ, and there are groups that are part of the Church of Christ, like the Boston Church of Christ or the L.A. Church of Christ, that are very cultic in the way in which they operate. One of the things that the Church of Christ emphasized was baptismal regeneration, and that continues to be a an issue if you ever interact with someone who is part of the Church of Christ. Probably the most well-known author who's associated with the Church of Christ today would be Max Lucado. But in any case, I'm not so interested in the Church of Christ as I am interested in the Restorationist movement because this paradigm sets up the platform for false teachers to come and start new cult movements by claiming that they somehow have been given new revelation that is going to get the church back to its primitive early church state. And it allows these self-proclaimed prophets and prophetesses to bypass 19 or 1800 years at this point, 1800 years of church history and say, well, all of that church history doesn't matter. We're going to go back to the early church. What they actually go back to are the early heresies. It's kind of interesting to see the early heresies regurgitated in these 19th century cult groups. And uh, in an attempt to get back to the early church, really all they rediscover are the ancient heresies that we talked about last semester, and then they regurgitate them as if they are something new. It's actually quite fascinating, and one of the things we talked about last semester was knowing the history of the ancient heresies will prepare you and help you in dealing with modern cult groups. Why is that? Because Satan simply recycles the same errors over and over again in church history. The modern American cults are nothing really new. They're just Gnosticism or even aspects of Islam and then aspects of Arianism and other ancient heresies all kind of mixed together. So let's talk a little bit about some of these cult groups, the groups that I call really the ugly stepchildren of the Second Great Awakening. First would be the Mormons. Uh, Mormonism started initially as an offshoot of the Church of Christ. That is why it is called the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. It was an offshoot initially of the Stone Campbell Restorationist movement. Of course, it included the clearly heretical teachings of a certain Joseph Smith, who in 1827 claimed that he had discovered some golden tablets and from these golden tablets, which he said were written in ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, he was able to translate the Book of Mormon. And so in 1830, we have a self-proclaimed prophet who writes a book called the Book of Mormon, which he claims came from these golden tablets that he discovered. That the Mormon, Mormons is an offshoot of the Church of Christ. Are you saying that Joseph Smith was actually part of the Church of Christ? And, and were, were, the, were the Mormons actually a part of the Church of Christ and broke off? Or are you saying just... Quite a number of the early followers of Joseph Smith had come out of the Church of Christ movement. And even the name, Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, reflects the fact that there was a close association early on between some of the initial followers of Joseph Smith and 
uh, the establishment of the Mormon Church. Uh, the Mormons located to Kirkland, Ohio, and then to Missouri and Illinois, and it was in Illinois that Joseph Smith was arrested and then killed while in prison when a mob attacked the prison and he was shot. Uh, interesting side note about Joseph Smith that I would recommend to you if you're interested in Mormon apologetics. There are many, 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 many areas in which Mormonism shows itself to be clearly unbiblical and anti-biblical. There is, just to warn you, quite an effort going on right now among certain evangelical groups to get Mormonism viewed not as a cult, but merely as another denomination. That's certainly what the Mormons would like. And uh, some of those things became really obvious during the recent presidential campaign of Mitt Romney. Uh, Mormonism is not another denomination, just to be clear. Mormonism is another religion altogether. It claims to be Christian, but it is inherently false, which is why we classify it as a cult. But uh, a side note that I think you'll find interesting uh, a couple of years ago, I watched a really helpful documentary about Joseph Smith relating to a particular book that is in the Pearl of Great Price called the Book of Abraham. And if you're interested in this, you can find the documentary. It's online at bookofabraham.org, I believe. But uh, Book of Abraham documentary, if you search for it in Google, you'll find it. The Book of Abraham really exposes the whole entire thing as a sham and a fraud. And as such, it becomes a really helpful tool in your apologetic against Mormons. When the Mormons were located in Ohio, this was shortly after Joseph Smith had published the Book of Mormon, there were some, <clears throat> there were some vendors who came through who were selling authentic Egyptian artifacts. Okay, we're in the early 19th century. There's been a lot of exploration of certain parts of the Mideast. We have in particular British entrepreneurs, uh, British... Um, yeah, British entrepreneurs who fund expeditions down to the Middle East, and those expeditions result in you know the raiding of tombs and pyramids and other things. That's why the British Museum has such an impressive Egyptology collection. Uh, and those things make their way back to Britain, and then they are sold, and by you know raising funds through the selling of actual authentic Egyptian artifacts, these entrepreneurs get their money back. Uh, some of these artifacts make their way to North America where they are being sold. The followers of Joseph Smith hear that there are some people selling authentic Egyptian artifacts and they get really excited. Why? Because Joseph Smith claims that he has just translated from ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs these golden tablets which conveniently go back up to heaven so they can't be authenticated. He has translated from them the Book of Mormon. So the followers of Joseph Smith get really excited. They contact some of these people and they arrange to purchase at a significant expense some authentic Egyptian scrolls. And these authentic Egyptian scrolls come into Joseph Smith's hands while he is there in Ohio. So now he has real Egyptian scrolls with real ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. Now, no one in the world in the early 1830s can read ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs because the Rosetta Stone has not yet been discovered, and so the modern art of ancient Egyptology has not yet developed. So nobody knows how to read ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs, but Joseph Smith, this self-proclaimed prophet, he claims to know how to do it, and now his followers have purchased for him this authentic Egyptian scroll. Joseph Smith then spends at least two years translating the scroll. And that scroll, the translation of that scroll, becomes the contents of the Book of Abraham, which is one of the books that is in the Pearl of Great Price, which is one of the scriptures uh, 
for the Mormon Church. The Mormon Church adds to the Bible three books, the Book of Mormon, the Doctrines and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price. And within the Pearl of Great Price, one of the sections is the Book of Abraham. But here's the thing. Those scrolls have survived. The actual Egyptian scrolls that Joseph Smith used to create the Book of Abraham, those scrolls have survived. And the Mormon Church located in Salt Lake City, Utah, has verified that the scrolls are the real scrolls that Joseph Smith used to create his translation of the Book of Mormon. Now, you guys know where this is going. The Book of Abraham is a story about Abraham and um, Abraham and Isaac, and in particular Abraham's offering of Isaac on the altar and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, the, the scroll that has survived from which the book of Abraham came, this is not going to surprise you, but it actually has absolutely nothing to do with Abraham or Isaac or any of the other biblical characters. It's actually an ancient Egyptian book of the dead. So it has nothing at all to do with the biblical account. And thanks to the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, modern Egyptologists actually know what the, what the scroll says. But here we have the actual scroll that Joseph Smith used to quote-unquote translate ancient Egyptian hieroglyph that the Mormon church admits and acknowledges is the scroll that he used that modern Egyptologists have been able to study and they've demonstrated that Joseph Smith created a quote-unquote translation of this book that actually had nothing at all to do with the real contents of the book whatsoever. In Joseph Smith's diary, he says on multiple occasions that he was at work translating the scroll. So in his own words, he says it was a translation. The, the entire house of cards then falls down because we can show, we can prove from history that Joseph Smith had no ability whatsoever to actually translate ancient Egyptian, which calls into question not only the Book of Abraham, but also the Book of Mormon, which he claims he also translated from ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. It's an interesting documentary. If you have an hour, it's worth your time to watch that documentary online. It exposes the entire house of cards. And it even ends with the testimony of several former Mormons who acknowledged that Finding out this information showed them what a sham the entire deal is. And even some others who said, yeah, they know the whole thing's fake, but they stay in it anyway because of the family relationships and other things that keep that whole network together. So anyway, a uh, little bit of history that um, goes a long way in understanding even where this all comes from. Uh, Joseph Smith himself, was, he had been arrested on several, several occasions, charged with fraud, charged with what was called treasure hunting, the idea of discovering supposed ancient artifacts and then trying to sell them to unsuspecting, um, unsuspecting buyers. It's just a form of fraud. Joseph Smith was known for this throughout his whole life. His biggest fraud, of course, was his establishment of this false religion of Mormonism. Uh, I talked about this, uh, some of you heard the message that I did here at Grace Church Sunday night a couple weeks ago on um, really how to recognize a false religion. And just to kind of reiterate that, some of the basic points. What is it that makes a false religion a false religion? Well, a false religion, and even Dr. MacArthur hinted at this a little bit this morning in chapel, a false religion is a religion that gets the core elements of the gospel, core elements of the things that you must believe in order to be saved, those core doctrines, those fundamental doctrines, they get those things wrong. Now, what are those fundamental doctrines? Well, I would suggest that it is, first and foremost, a right view of, of the Savior, a right view of who God is, a right view of who Jesus is, and then secondly, a right view of salvation. You have to have a right understanding of the basic fundamental tenets of the gospel. And then thirdly, a right view of the scriptures. You have to understand that the scriptures is indeed the word of God. And if your movement fails 
in those three areas, it demonstrates itself to be a false movement. It can call itself Christian, but it's not Christian at all. So a right view of the Savior, a right view of salvation, and a right view of the Scriptures. And uh, we can see with each of these cult groups that they fail in all three of those areas. So Mormonism is kind of an easy one, but in Mormonism we see that there's a wrong view of who Jesus is. Mormons, like the ancient Gnostics, teach that Jesus is just one of many gods. There's a whole pantheon of gods. In fact, Jesus is the, um, <clears throat> he is the physical offspring of uh, relations between God the Father and Mary, which in itself is a weird distortion of the virgin birth. But the Heavenly Father is just one of many iterations of God in this pantheon of gods. And if you're a good Mormon, you yourself can one day be a god. That's teaching of Mormonism. So a wrong view of God, a wrong view of the Savior, and then a wrong view of salvation. Salvation within Mormonism is salvation by works, by being a good Mormon. And then thirdly, a wrong view of the scriptures. They add to the scriptures these other books. Uh, we could apply that test to any false religion. We could apply that test to any apostate form of Christianity, Roman Catholicism being an example of that, or any cult group. And I would identify a cult group as that which has always been false from its very beginnings, even though it claims to be an offshoot of Christianity. All right, moving on to the Seventh-day Adventists. Historically, at least, I think the Seventh-day Adventists qualify as a cult group. Why? Because with regard to a right view of the Savior, Seventh-day Adventism teaches a second work of atonement that is taking place in heaven, so it's not the once-for-all atonement at the cross. We'll talk about that in a moment. In terms of a right view of the Scriptures, Seventh-day Adventism at least historically elevated the prophecies of Ellen G. White to the same level as Scripture. That's a massive problem. And then in terms of a right view of salvation, the early Adventists emphasized certain aspects of keeping the law of Moses. That's why they meet on the Sabbath. That's why they follow certain dietary laws. And uh, I think at that level, they fall into the same trap as some of the ancient Judaizers and Ebionites that we talked about in this class. So to believe that there's a second work of atonement going on in heaven, to believe that the prophecies of Ellen G. White are authoritative, and to believe that you must keep the dietary laws and go to church on Saturday in order to go to heaven, that puts you outside of historic Christian orthodoxy. There's a lot of debate about um, if people are truly saved who are in these cults, like whether Mormonism, Catholicism, Seventh-day Adventism. So what do you... What are your thoughts on truly being born again while still remaining in these? Yeah, whether or not people can be truly saved and still be part of these cult groups. Um, let me say it this way. If a person is truly saved, I believe that the Bible teaches that in order to be saved, a person must rightly understand who Jesus is and what he did. A person must rightly understand that his salvation is fully and wholly a work of Christ and that his own good works merit nothing in terms of his right standing before God. And a person must understand that the Bible is the word of God and therefore is the highest authority for that person's life. A person who understands those things... I find it difficult to believe that they would be able to stay very long in a movement that teaches and the opposite of and clearly undermines those fundamental doctrines. So is it, is it possible for an individual to be saved and, and affirm those core elements of what it means to be a Christian and yet still attend a church that undermines those doctrines? I suppose that it's possible. But could a person stay there and be comfortable there for very long? I find that very hard to, to fathom. All right, let's talk a little bit about the Seventh-day Adventists. <clears throat> uh, really starts with a guy named William Miller. And Miller was one of those date setters. 
Uh, here's another place in church history where we are reminded of the fact that we should not try and set dates for when Christ will return because Christ himself said that no one knows. And so if you think that you know, you're wrong and you will be proven wrong and made a mockery of when it becomes obvious that your date was wrong, like on the next day after whatever date you set. <laughs> that happened to William Miller. Uh, Miller was influenced by Ellen G. White, the self-proclaimed prophetess, and together they determined that Christ was going to return 2,300 years after Ezra's return to Jerusalem. I'm not exactly sure how they came up with that calculation, but in light of that, they taught clearly that Christ would return in 1843. This will not come as a shock to you, but that prophecy did not come true. In light of that, they determined that their prediction, their math, must have been wrong. And so they moved the date one year later to 1844. Christ did not come back in 1844. At that point, followers of William Miller, the Seventh-day Adventists, experienced what in their own literature they call the Great Disappointment. And I think that would be an understatement. At that point, Ellen G. White, William Miller, they decided, they determined that their calculations could not have been wrong. They were so convinced. Instead, they said, what must have been wrong was the event that we associated with those calculations. So the calculations weren't wrong. Our math wasn't wrong. Our theology wasn't wrong. We just had the wrong event associated with that. We thought it was going to be the return of Christ. Actually, what happened on that date in 1844 was that Christ stood up, got up off of the throne where he was seated next to the Father's hand and went into the heavenly temple and began a second work of atonement in heaven called Christ's work of heavenly atonement. That's what he started in 1844. So in an effort to cover up their miscalculation, they actually went from bad to worse and created a doctrine of secondary atonement where Christ is supposedly doing a second work in his heavenly sanctuary. In addition to their belief of the second work of atonement, they also teach soul sleep, the idea that people who are dead are completely unconscious until the resurrection. So contra Paul's statement in 2 Corinthians 5.8 that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We have the Seventh-day Adventists, the Millerites, who teach that there's no consciousness whatsoever after death until the resurrection. They also teach annihilationism, that those who are condemned to hell will eventually disappear into nothingness. And uh, they promote worship on the seventh day, uh, Sabbatarianism, but not Christian Sabbatarianism like the Puritans where worship is on Sunday. They actually go back to Old Testament Sabbatarianism where they insist that worship is on Saturday. And so Seventh-day Adventists, they meet on Saturday. Yes? Um, this is one of the first times we're talking about annihilationism. What, what, was there any uh, proponents of annihilation, uh, annihilationism before the uh, Seventh-day Yes, back in the early, some of the early church fathers, not the earliest church fathers, but uh, still Antonicene fathers, Origen and others, there were some who kind of waffled on the eternality aspect, the eternal part of eternal punishment. And so there were some in history, I think influenced more by certain aspects of Greek philosophy and perhaps influenced by even the implications of the doctrine of eternal punishment and, and feeling uncomfortable about those implications kind of waffled on that. And again, that's where you know, we, we say, well, this is what the Bible teaches, and we're just going to be faithful to what the Bible teaches, and we're not going to try and mitigate against or waffle on something that Scripture clearly reveals. But um, yes, you, you do have kind of some waffling on that at certain points in church history. 
Yep, Jason. Yeah, this may seem just like a naive question, but in light of, you know, you've gone through two, those are two big things between the Egyptian hieroglyphs and obviously the date setting. I just wonder, other than just, you made the comment, there's family ties in the one, that's why they didn't pull out. Other than the obvious, we're in it so deep, we can't possibly turn back now. I just wonder what makes these so buoyant even now, right? You look at those two, whatever they are, they're still very much alive and functioning. Like, in light of all of these truths, I just wonder for us going out, you know, what we can take from this. Is it simply a matter of, well, we just deny it and we know what we believe? Like, what can we take from? Because to me, it just seems so obvious. What do you do when you're presented with such obvious frailty of what you believe in? You know, like, do, do you, I guess that's kind of a jump mess, but I just, it blows me away that these are still so big. Yeah, what makes these, what makes cult groups so attractive? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's several factors that can answer that question. I, I think one of the issues certainly that we have to recognize is that spiritual deception has an element of demonic and satanic power behind it. And I don't mean uh, satanic power in sort of a weird mystical way. I mean in the sense of these are doctrines of demons and uh, this is what the God of this age does, is he blinds the hearts of unbelievers. So there is that aspect to it, false religion. Uh, we could say this about any false religion, not even the Christian cults. You think about some of these things logically, and the whole thing is so entirely ridiculous, you ha wonder how any educated person could possibly believe this stuff. And the answer, I think, at a spiritual level comes down to the fact that um, the God of this world has blinded their hearts. Um, but uh, I think there are some other factors as well. I think part of it is that there is a massive naivete on the part of many evangelical Christians in America. That uh, the American church, and I'm speaking at large, and this would certainly include the mainstream Protestant denominations and also American evangelicalism. The American church is so doctrinally naive that when the doorbell rings and there's a couple people standing there, your average American Christian has no ability to answer the problems with the movement and the, I'll call them missionaries, the salespeople who go out for these different cult groups. They are trained to make their movement sound as much like evangelicalism as possible. And so if you talk to two Mormon missionaries, they will talk to you in language that sounds evangelical. And that's where, I mean, Titus 1.9, uh, an elder is responsible to be able to teach sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. That's why apologetics is such an important part of your training here at the seminary. You need to be ready to equip your people to answer these kinds of heresies. So it's camouflage, and uh, if, they can, if they can kind of hook people, then they get them in the system, and once they get them in the system, then you get all the other networking and, and those kinds of things that keep people in. Oftentimes these cult groups are highly manipulative, high pressure types of things. It's hard to leave. Um, and then I do think you have, like in the case of the Mormon church, I do think you have really, <laughs> I hate to say really good, really effective PR by the Mormon church to present themselves as being like super fam family friendly. And, and so you get people who are like, oh, I, you know, I, I want my family to be like that. And so they become Mormons because of the family values, which is so ironic because Mormonism, if you study it historically, is one of the most anti-family value movements that was ever started. I mean, polygamy. Uh, Brigham Young had 50 wives. 50, five zero. Uh, how is that family friendly? Um, and, and so uh, there's a lot of camouflage that goes on. Yep. Um, just a, a, com a conversation with another student who was interacting with a guy who was involved in one of these cult groups and one of the things that he mentioned that was saddening to us is that he felt more 
I guess, kindly welcomed and, and received. I mean, not that it was based, that the, their beliefs were based in truth, but it was sad for us to, for for him to recount the experiences that he's had in so-called, you know, maybe evangelical fellowships where there hasn't been a welcoming environment, and to go back to or to feel more comfortable, or more warmly received in one of those groups because, you know, of that warm embrace. That was, you know, very sad. We actually dealt with it. A guy from our church who went back to um, the Latter-day Saints Church. I don't know if it was necessary for that reason, but it was because they, you know, offered, I guess, more resources or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it was, a, it was a sad thing for us to hear. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we live in a world in which, especially now, everybody thinks truth is relative. And so they make their decisions based on what they find to be best for them emotionally or socially and not what is actually best for their eternal souls in terms of truth. Yes, sir? Kind of uh, follows your sin as well, uh, where you give in to your own lust. You know, oh, absolutely. Um, in a way, it's kind of a judgment. Um, sure. Where, you know, like Dr. Coffin was talking about suicide, you know, there's something more there. When they somebody makes a decision to to be involved in something that's very clear, it's false. Oh, absolutely! All all false religion is rooted in sin and rooted in fallenness, and um, and to you know to believe things that are false and reject things that are true that is a heinous sin. So certainly we would not discount the fact that sin and even a hardening in that sin by God, is a form of divine judgment. And I think you see that spelled out in Romans 1, where the naturalistic false religions that are described there in Romans 1 are clearly stated as being a result of a sinful rejection of God and then of His hardening in that rejection. It also occurred to me as you're talking about um, annihilationism here, um, it, it seems like almost um, all of these cult groups, at least the ones I can think of, hedge on eternal punishment. They have some way out of it. Either you can rescue them out of hell, or they're completely annihilated, or it's not as bad as we know it to be. And it was just, it was just an interesting. I just now made that connection as you know, as you were talking about some of that. Almost every one of them that um, that I know of don't teach the same kind of eternal punishment that we do. Yeah, you know, I, th I think it's even deeper than that. It, I think these false religions, at the core of it, it's a, it's a wrong view of God. But that translates often into a wrong view of man, in which they elevate man much higher. So they, so they begin with this premise that man is basically good, which of course is the premise on which they build their model of salvation, that man can work his way to heaven. And so as long as you're basically a good person, uh, you know, even within Mormonism, there's three levels of heaven, and basically good people, almost everybody gets into the third level of heaven. And so you're right, it, it, it affects their views of eternal punishment because only the very, very worst people in society ever would experience eternal punishment anyway. And... Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, the systems are flawed all the way through, and you see those flaws show up in all of the different doctrines that they touch. And, and of some of the people that I know of, they've been drawn to, to them and away from uh, Orthodox Christianity for that reason. Hmm. And sometimes because they're trying to look for answers for loved ones who have passed away. Or, sure. You know, they don't want to be in something that, uh, that in which they have to accept. Those who have passed away are forever in hell. Sure. Yeah, and in the case of the Mormons, they, you know, they baptize for the dead in order to try and undo things. And Yep. All right, we're almost out of time here, but just to mention two more quick things. Uh, the rise of Christian science, uh, a really another regurgitation of ancient Gnosticism. It's the teaching that the world around us is just an illusion. So when, you, when you're acting sick, it's all in your head. That was what Christian science taught. And so there's no reason, there's no reason why you should ever really be sick. And if you just make up your mind that you're not sick, then you can 
condemn those symptoms and then you can heal yourself. Uh, that whole thing is utterly ridiculous and um, I wish we had more time to talk about that because Mary Baker Eddy um, and the Christian science movement, not creation science, not scientists who are Christian, Christian science is the name of the cult, is a, uh, is a clear and obvious um, misteaching. Uh, if the Mormons are sort of a regurgitation of certain aspects of Gnosticism, there's also actually a lot of things, parallels to the rise of Islam, and uh, we could draw those out at some point. Actually, last semester when we talked about the rise of Islam, we talked about some of those later iterations in Mormonism. Seventh-day Adventism, in many ways, is a reiteration of the legalism of the Judaizers with their adherence to the Mosaic Law. Uh, Christian science is a regurgitation of, I suppose, other aspects of Gnosticism. Uh, certainly the Docetism, that this physical world is just a mirage, or that the physical world is bad and uh, everything operates on a spiritual plane. The Jehovah's Witnesses, then, would be a regurgitation of Arianism. Uh, Arianism was the denial of the full deity and equality of Jesus Christ as the Son of God and the second member of the Trinity, and the Jehovah's Witnesses denied that. And so, again, Jehovah's Witnesses, they distort the Bible. They came up with their own translation called the New World Translation. They distort who Jesus is by denying that he is truly God and instead saying he's just a creature. And they distort salvation, because salvation, again, is by being a good person. In fact, in Jehovah's Witness, teaching grace is just essentially belonging to the Jehovah's Witness movement so that then you can work your way to heaven. And the whole thing is utterly ridiculous. Um, just give me one more minute to make one more comment about the JWs, and then we'll be done. Charles Taze Russell which is where the whole movement comes out of. And he was influenced by William Miller and the Millerites. So we see some connections even between Seventh-day Adventism and the Jehovah's Witnesses, including annihilationism and soul sleep and some of these other doctrines. Uh, he thought the end of the world was World War I. So when World War I broke out, he was convinced it was the end of the world. And the Jehovah's Witnesses have made predictions after Russell with Judge Rutherford and others, they have made predictions about the return of Christ at least 10 times, maybe a dozen times since they began in the early 1900s, starting with World War I, and everything is based off of World War I. And so today, the current prediction is that Christ will return in 2034, I believe it is, or it might be 38. Um, because World War I started in 1914 and, and went till 1918. It, they take Noah's Ark and the 120 years that he used to build the Ark, and they add 120 years to World War I, and that's where they've come up with their newest date as to when Christ will return. But you'll notice with all of these groups, Joseph Smith also predicted that Christ was going to return, and he didn't. With all of these groups, False prophecy is one of the earmarks of these false movements.